Hi, I'm Dr. Ali Jensik. I teach political science courses with BC Online. My doctoral degree is in political science, and I've been teaching political science courses online and face-to-face -face since 2008. Here, we will be reviewing important information about the founding documents, and this should help you feel more confident about taking the Civic Literacy Competency Exam. So let's dive in and set the scene. Early in the United States history, we're talking around 1761, 15 years before the Declaration of Independence was signed, the American colonists were still loyal to the British, and they celebrated King George III becoming the king. The colony stretched from present day Maine to Georgia. The colonists came from a number of European backgrounds, but most were English, and they believed very strongly in the principles of the Magna Carta, which is a document we will discuss in just a minute. But for now, what I want you to know is that the Magna Carta established the principles that no one is above the law, not even the king, and that no one can take away certain rights. But in 1763, King George III began to assert his authority over the colonies. England had been fighting in the Seven Years' War and had just won. King George III decided that the colonists needed to share in paying for the cost of that. The English colonists protested this. They said that they had rights. After nearly a decade of trying to assert their rights, armed conflict occurred, and eventually the colonists separated from British rule. We'll explore that in a lot more detail. But before we go any further, one thing I wanna note is that Philadelphia is often considered to be America's birthplace, and the city played a central role in the creation of the United States of America and the creation and founding of our government. In fact, Five of the most important documents were written, at least in part, by the founding fathers in Philadelphia. So now with that little bit of history behind us, we're going to start to explore and review some of the important founding documents. So let's start with the Magna Carta. The document was issued on June 15, 1215. Magna Carta is medieval Latin for Great Charter of Freedoms and its common meaning is Royal Charter. The Magna Carta is considered to be one of the most important documents in history. It put into writing the principle that the king and his government were not above the law. So the Magna Carta was meant to prevent the king from exploiting his power, and it established the principle that everyone is subject to the law, even the king. This important document guaranteed the rights of individuals and laid the foundation for lasting legal concepts like the ban on cruel and unusual punishments, the right to a fair trial, and the idea that justice could not be sold or unnecessarily delayed. Although we've seen a lot of evolution since 1215, the Magna Carta is an important symbol of liberty to this day. The Mayflower Compact was a set of rules for self-governance that was created by the English settlers who traveled to the New World on the Mayflower. In 1620, the pilgrims and other settlers went on the Mayflower and set sail for America. Their intention was to go to Northern Virginia. The Mayflower Compact was originally called the Agreement Between the Settlers of New Plymouth, and it was the first governing document of Plymouth Colony. It was signed on November 11th, 1620. It was written and signed by the 41 male passengers of the Mayflower and consisted of separatists, Puritans, and adventurers. Women and children were not allowed to sign the compact. The Mayflower Compact is very short. It created what they called a civil body politic to pass just and equal laws for the general good of the colony. This is the first time we saw the idea of self-government in the new world. The Mayflower Compact remained active until 1691 when the Plymouth Colony became a part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So the Mayflower Compact was an influential founding document for the founding fathers when they created the constitution. The European Enlightenment is an 18th century intellectual movement that questioned traditional authority and focused on creating better societies. The use of reason, the scientific method, and progress were three main concepts. It came about due to years of mistreatment under monarchies and the impacts of the Thirty Years' War, combined with an exploration of the world and the interests of European philosophers in this expanding world around them. Two important philosophers of this time were Immanuel Kant, who emphasized thinking on one's own authority and using reason to lead to freedom and progress, and John Locke, who focused on natural rights like life, liberty, and property. 
The enlightenment led to rational ideas about government. And this is different than what we had seen in the past, which is divine right, where the right to rule is given by God. This led to an increase in Republican thought. Now, in this instance, Republican isn't one of the parties we think of in our voting system. So what we're talking about here is the original classical meaning, which is ruled by the consent of the governed. So liberty and the will of the people are what's important here. During the Enlightenment, scientific reasoning, rationalism, and empiricism were important, and we saw new emphasis on schooling and medicine. We also saw human rights defended against tyranny. The philosophers of the Enlightenment spread information about natural law, social contracts, and ethics, and this helped challenge the structures of government and society. They favored limited, limited government without religious interference. Logical thinking was valued more than church and religion. Of course, England wasn't in a bubble and the Enlightenment impacted the colonists too. And in many ways, it influenced the leaders of the American Revolution. Some of the main ideas were freedom of speech and press, religious tolerance and equality. Since the colonists did not have these things, they rebelled against England for their independence, which we will explore more in just a few minutes. For now, it's important to remember that due to the ideas of the Enlightenment, the concept of natural law became very important in challenging the divine right of kings and, challenge, and shifting towards the establishment of a social contract and legal rights in the form of classical republicanism. So just like here in the United States, we have a Bill of Rights, and we'll be exploring that more later. Well, the English also had a document called the Bill of Rights. The English Bill of Rights reaffirmed and guaranteed rights that dated back to the Magna Carta. It was created by the English Parliament, and it was associated with what is referred to as the Glorious Revolution of 1688. It was signed into law by William III and Mary II when they became the king and queen after King James II was removed from the throne. The English Bill of Rights includes separation of powers, limits the powers of the king and the queen, calls for democratic elections, strengthens freedom of speech, and outlines specific constitutional and civil rights. So we see a lot of concepts from the English Bill of Rights in our constitution, particularly in the First Amendment. With that said, when we look at our constitution and the English Bill of Rights, a huge difference can be seen, and that's in terms of religion. So the English Bill of Rights favored Protestants and excluded non-religious individuals and Catholics from serving in parliament, their government, or in any civil or military role. They even had test acts where people want, who wanted to serve in public office had to take a religious test in order to be able to serve. Now, meanwhile, in the United States, in our First Amendment, we disestablished the idea of having a national religion. John Locke is one of the most influential political philosophers of our time. As we discussed earlier, he refuted the theory of the divine right of kings and argued that all persons are endowed with natural rights to life, liberty, and property, and that rulers who fail to protect those rights may be removed by the people, by force if necessary. He defended the claim that men are by nature free and equal against claims that God had made all people naturally subject to a monarch. Locke argued that a ruler gains authority through the consent of the governed. Locke believed that the most basic human law of nature is the preservation of mankind. To serve that purpose, he reasoned, individuals have both a right and a duty to preserve their own lives. Another influential person of the time is Thomas Paine. Common Sense is a 47 page pamphlet published by Paine in Philadelphia in 1776. In it, he advocated to the people in the 13 colonies to fight for independence from Great Britain. He wrote in a way that your average citizen could understand and feel motivated and encouraged to act. He used moral and political arguments to encourage the colonists to fight for an equal and fair form of government. He explained why independence was necessary. Thomas Paine argued that Americans had a unique opportunity to change the course of history by creating a new form of government where people were free and had the power to rule themselves. He said, and I quote, we have every opportunity and every encouragement before us to form the noblest, purest constitution on the face of the earth. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. Paine's pamphlet became widely talked about and it helped create a lot of public support for the revolution. 
It also put a lot of pressure on the rebellion's leaders to declare independence. Even after the victory over the British, Payne's common sense remained very influential and some of the ideas can be seen in the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Abigail Adams was the wife of John Adams and the mother of John Quincy Adams. She's considered to be her husband's closest advisor. Abigail Adams is also considered to be one of the most documented first ladies, and that's in large part due to the many letters that she wrote to her husband, John Adams. The really cool thing about many of these letters is that they give us a first person account of what the American Revolutionary War was like for someone who was on the home front. While John Adams was in Philadelphia during the Continental Congress, John would seek out advice from Abigail Adams on a variety of topics. So she was like his advisor and confidant, and their letters are very intellectual in nature, and they discuss important political topics of the time. One of the most remembered and talked about letters was from March 31st, 1776. Many refer to this as the Remember the Ladies letter. Abigail Adams wrote to John Adams asking for the Continental Congress and him to not forget about women during their fight for independence from Great Britain. She wrote, and I quote, and by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to ferment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. That's huge. The Virginia Declaration of Rights is mostly the work of George Mason. It was drafted in 1776 and it declared all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights. The enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. It also included the right to either reform or abolish an inadequate government. Some civil liberties were also included. This is freedom of the press, freedom of religion, and the idea that individuals cannot be deprived of their liberties unless they're doing something that is against the law. The Virginia Declaration of Rights consists of 16 articles that covered a wide range of rights and how these rights should form the basis of government. These articles established a government that was a servant of the people with a separation of powers. The Virginia Declaration of Rights is considered to be unique because it prescribes legal rights as well as moral principles to describe how the government should be run. So based on what I have said here, I'm sure it doesn't come as a surprise that the Virginia Declaration of Rights influenced later documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. The United States Declaration of Independence, which was originally called the Unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America, was adopted by the Second Continental Congress. The document officially severed all political ties to King George III, while also describing the motivations of the colonists for the separation. The founders met in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1776. In total, 56 people signed the Declaration of Independence. A lesser known fact is that the vote for independence actually occurred on July 2nd, and the majority of the signers actually signed it on August 2nd. This is because it had to be in gross, which means it had to be written on parchment paper in clear handwriting, and also because New York's delegates didn't receive authorization to sign until July 9th. Now, Thomas Jefferson is the primary author but the Committee of Five also helped draft a formal statement for the colony's case for independence. The five members of this committee were John Adams of Massachusetts, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Robert Livingston of New York, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, and Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. One thing I wanna note is that it was very important for the 13 colonies to come together as one united front. The colonies were declaring their independence from Great Britain and they needed other countries to take them seriously as a world power and to come to their aid as allies. They couldn't be 13 different colonies and achieve that goal. So the Declaration of Independence was a legal declaration and it changed things a lot for the colonists because before they had viewed themselves as separate, sort of like the various countries that make up Europe. On July 4th, 1776, the Second Continental Congress issued the Declaration of Independence. The document proclaimed 
the separation of the American colonies from Great Britain and formally began the American Revolution. There are three parts of the Declaration of Independence. The first part is the preamble. The second part lists the sins of King George III. And the third part is the Declaration of Independence from Britain and all political connections between the British crown and the free and independent states of America. The preamble to the Declaration of Independence contains the entire theory of American government in a single inspiring passage. I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So what I would like to do now is I'd like to take a moment to address some key terms and important concepts that form the philosophical foundations of our government. If you're not familiar with these concepts, you might want to take, make flashcards of these definitions. I'll just leave them on the screen here. You probably want to make flashcards out of them. Um, We'll just start with the first one. National sovereignty is the supreme, absolute, and uncontrollable power by which an independent state is governed and from which all specific political powers are derived. The intentional independence of a state combined with the right and power of regulating its internal affair affairs without foreign interference. Due process, the due process right established by the 14th Amendment guarantees that the government cannot take a person's basic right to life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The due process right is designed to protect citizens from actions taken by state government, counties, towns, and cities. Natural law, a philosophical theory that states that humans have certain rights, moral values, and responsibilities that are inherent in human nature. These are held to be common to all humans and derived from nature rather from, than from rules of society. Self-evident truth, something that is known to be true by understanding its meaning without proof and or by ordinary human reason. Equality of all persons means that everyone, regardless of race or gender, religion or disability, should be given the same opportunities and legal rights. Limited government a theory of governance in which the government only has those powers delegated to it by law, often through a written constitution. Popular sovereignty, the principle that, that the authority of a state and its government is created and sustained by the consent of its people through their elected representatives who are the source of all political power. Inalienable rights, that which cannot be given away or taken away life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, for instance. Okay, so those are some definitions you should make sure you're familiar with. Before the Revolutionary War, each state had its own constitution. The Articles of Confederation was a written agreement ratified by the 13 original states that established the functions of the national government of the US after it declared its independence from Great Britain. It was adopted by the Second Continental Congress on November 15th, 1777, and made effective on March 1st, 1781. The Second Continental Congress then became known as the Congress of the Confederation. This government was in effect from 1781 until 1788. Although it was eventually replaced by the United States Constitution, it has played a very important role in the foundation of our country. After declaring independence from Great Britain, the new nation had to create a new government to replace the monarchy it had previously been ruled by. After much debate, the Americans adopted the Articles of Confederation and it established a very weak national government that consisted of a one house legislature known as the Confederation Congress. Congress had the power to declare war, sign treaties and settle disputes between the states as well as borrow or print money and ask for funds from individual states. However, the states rarely provided the requested money to the federal government. This is because Americans were so afraid of having another strong centralized government, they refused to give Congress the power to tax. So we'll talk about this in more detail soon, 
But in 1783, the Americans secured their independence from Great Britain with the Treaty of Paris, 1783. And that's when they really went full steam ahead on building a new nation. Even though they had some success, like passing the Northwest Ordinance that we'll talk about in a second, the Confederation Congress faced many difficulties. Primarily, this was due to the weak nature of the national government. Without having the ability to tax, the federal government could not pay for a military, which is a very important issue for people living in the Northwest Territory where a lot of movement was occurring. So they ended up having a meeting called the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787. They revised the Articles of Confederation and created a new and stronger constitution where the federal government would have the power to tax. Some weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation can be noted, including Congress lacked the authority to regulate commerce, making it unable to protect or standardize trade between foreign nations and the various states. We just discussed the inability to tax a second ago. Additionally, the Articles of Confederation had no executive branch because the new states did not want there to be too strong of a central power. Implementation of most decisions, including modifications to the articles, required unanimous approval of all 13 state legislatures. As you can imagine, getting all 13 states to agree was next to impossible. We'll talk about the Constitution in more detail in a minute and also in the Constitution boot camp. But for now, what's important for you, for you to remember is that the three most important changes that were made from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution were the addition of the House through representatives in the Senate, the idea of the separation of powers and checks and balances. The Declaration of Independence, which officially broke all political ties between the American colonies and Great Britain, set forth the ideas and the principles behind a just and fair government. So the Articles of Confederation reflected the Declaration of Independence. On the other hand, the Constitution outlines how the government will function, so the Articles of Confederation influence the Constitution. All these documents are based on the idea that all people have certain fundamental rights that government is created to protect. These include the common law rights, which come from British sources like the Magna Carta, as well as laws based on decisions from previous court cases. They also include the natural rights that the founders believed came from God. So these documents have a lot of similarities at their core, but they also have some differences, which we'll examine. The Constitution of Massachusetts was the first state constitution to include a separation of powers. The structural framework adopted in Massachusetts is identical to that adopted in the United States Constitution, and it includes the right of the people to set up what government they believe will secure their safety, prosperity, and happiness. We also see other important aspects of the US Constitution and the Constitution of Massachusetts, such as, such as search and seizure, self-incrimination, and confrontational witnesses, as well as cruel and unusual punishment. On September 3rd, 1783, representatives of King George III and the US signed the Treaty of Paris, which officially ended the American Revolution with England. So the 13 colonies became independent from Great Britain with that signature. The treaty did a number of things, including defining the US border with Great Britain, granting the Northwest Territory to the United States, securing fishing rights for American boats in the Grand Banks and other waters that were located off the British Canadian coastline, opening up the Mississippi River for navigation by citizens of the United States and Great Britain, restoring property and releasing prisoners of war. Now there were two other treaties of Paris and I don't want you to confuse them with the one we're focusing on here. So I just wanna give you some quick background information on those two. The Treaty of Paris of 1763 ended the French and Indian War between England and France. So that, one's the, that one is known as the Seven Years War. As a result of the 1763 Treaty of Paris, France gave up all of its territories in mainland North America, effectively ending any foreign military threat to the British colonies there. And then the Treaty of Paris in 1898 ended the Spanish-American War, and that resulted in Cuba's independence from Spain, as well as the US acquiring Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. The Northwest Ordinances are a series of ordinances, so we'll examine each piece. 
The Northwest Ordinance of 1784 was written by Thomas Jefferson and adopted by the United States Congress of the Confederation under the Articles of Confederation. The land north of the Ohio River, west of the Appalachian Mountains, and east of the Mississippi River were to be divided into 10 separate states that would be the first territories. They would remain territories until they had attained the same population as the least populous state in America, and then the territory would become a state with the same rights as the original 13 states. The Northwest Ordinance of 1784 guaranteed self-government to the residents of the territories. Something that's worth noting is that they were one single vote short, so Congress rejected a clause that would have prohibited slavery throughout the West. The Northwest Ordinance of 1785 established a framework for the addition of new states. Most importantly, it declared that the new states would be equal to previously established states. Government leaders included this policy in all future legislation dealing with the addition of new states. The Northwest Ordinance of 1785 called for scientific serving of the territory's lands and then subdividing them according to a rectangular grid system and townships of 36 square miles. The sale of the 16th section would finance public education. The Northwest Ordinance of 1785 set up a standardized system so that the settlers could purchase the title to farmland in the undeveloped West. At this time, Congress didn't have the power to raise revenue by direct taxation, so land sales provided an important revenue stream for the country at this time. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 did several key things, including charting, chartering a government for the Northwest Territory, providing a method for admitting new states to the Union from the territory, listing a bill of rights that were guaranteed in the territory, civil liberties and public education were included in the ordinance, and then banning slavery in the new territories. Ultimately, the Northwest Ordinance provided a path toward statehood for the territories that were northwest of the Ohio River, which is the part of the United States that would become the future states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. So the Northwest Ordinance accelerated westward expansion and established that all states would be equal regardless of when they were established. The series of ordinances worked together. The Northwest Ordinance of 1785 put the Northwest Ordinance of 1784 in operation by providing a mechanism for selling and settling in the land, while the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 addressed the political needs of the area. The Federalist, most well known as the Federalist Papers, is a series of 85 essays that were written between October 1787 and May 1788. The essays were published anonymously under the name Publius in newspapers throughout New York. With that said, they were written by uh, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison. And we know who most of them are attributed to, and we can make educated guesses about the others. You'll see what I mean in a minute when we discuss a few specific Federalist Papers. So you may be wondering why these 85 essays were written. The answer to that is that the Federalist Papers were an attempt by the writers to urge New Yorkers to ratify the proposed United States Constitution, which was drafted in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. In order to adopt the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation would need to be replaced. So the authors were trying to explain the different parts of the Constitution in great detail so that the people would be able to understand the various parts and rally behind its passage. It's important to note that both Hamilton and Madison were members of the Constitutional Convention and because of this, throughout history, the Federalist Papers have been used to interpret the intentions of the individuals who created the Constitution. So this brings us to another important point. In addition to addressing the various aspects of the Constitution, the Federalist Papers were also used to address points of dissent or any disagreements that were arising related to the Constitution. And that's where we see the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. There were some key differences between these two groups. The Federalists wanted a strong government and a strong executive branch, while the Anti-Federalists wanted a weaker central government. Federalists wanted a representative democracy with a single representative for every 30,000 people. Anti-Federalists wanted stronger state governments at the expense of the federal government. They wanted frequent elections, smaller districts, and a more direct democracy. In a direct democracy, the people decide on policies without any lawmakers or representatives, while in a representative democracy, 
people vote for representatives who then enact the policy initiatives. The Federalists did not want a Bill of Rights. They thought that the new Constitution was enough. The Anti-Federalists, on the other hand, demanded a Bill of Rights. The reason that a lot of the Anti-Federalists wanted a weak central government was because they saw what happened in Great Britain with King George III, and they equated a strong government with one that could easily become tyrannical. Others were concerned about having a strong government because they were afraid that a strong government would be dominated by the wealthy. The Anti-Federalists thought that the states had already given up too much power to the new federal government. So now let's take a look at a, a few of the key essays from the Federalist Papers. We'll start with Federalist Paper number 10, written by James Madison. Federalist Paper number 10 is among the most highly regarded of all American political writings and is perhaps the most famous of all the Federalist Papers. Again, as we just discussed, the point of these papers was to explain to the citizens all of the different aspects of the Constitution that were being proposed. In Federalist Paper number 10, Madison writes that a strong federal government can protect liberty because it can guard against the dangers of control by a narrow interest, which he called a faction. Federalist Paper number 10 is considered an explicit rejection of direct democracy by the founding fathers. Instead, it argues that a representative republic would be more effective against partisanship and factionalism. From this perspective, the larger, the better. Federalist Paper number 10 is important because it warns us about the power of factions and competing interests over the United States government. It argues that in a representative democracy, ideas can be examined by qualified office holders and the odds of one majority group getting all of the political power is nearly impossible. So both Federalist Paper number 10 and Federalist Paper number 51 examine how to make a government that's strong, but not too strong. And we'll take a look at Federalist number 51 in just a moment. Federalist paper number 14 was written by James Madison. According to the Articles of Confederation, each state retained its sovereignty, freedom, and independence in every power, jurisdiction, and right. But we just took a look at how the system set up by the Articles of Confederation did not work and was ineffective in so many ways. So the Constitution aimed to create a stronger general government with three branches. Federalist paper number 14 addressed one of the biggest anti-federalist objections, which was that the large size of the United States would make it impossible to govern justly as a single country. In Federalist paper number 14, Madison addresses this, and he also clarifies the difference between democracy and republic. Madison explained that in a democracy, when an assembly is necessary, every citizen would need to attend. Of course, this would be way too much with a large territory where the citizens are spread out. Instead, when there is a republic, only the representatives need to gather, which is a lot more practical. Federalist paper number 31 was written by Alexander Hamilton, and in it, he argued that the government must possess all the powers necessary for achieving its objective, and these powers can't be limited because it's impossible to predict what problems the country could face in the future. The government also had to have money to fulfill the responsibilities of the country, so there has to be a means of making revenue. One of these means, and the one that is the focus of Federalist Paper number 31, is the power of taxation. Hamilton argues that the representatives will do what they have to do to prevent the abuse of the power of taxation, and he dismisses anti-federalists who thought that giving the federal government the authority to tax would make it tyrannical while leaving the state governments at the mercy of the national government. Federalist paper number 39 was written by James Madison, and in it, he continues to define the Republican form of government. He says that a government, a government cannot be called Republican if it gets its power from a few people or from a favored and wealthy class. Federalist paper number 39 also explains the mixture of federal and national elements in five essential parts of the Constitution. Its ratification or foundation is national, is national the sources of its ordinary powers are partly federal in the Senate and partly national in the House. The operation of its powers on individuals is national. The extent of the powers are federal and the method of amendment are neither wholly federal nor national. So based on the mixture of elements, Madison concluded, quote, the proposed constitution therefore is in its strictness, neither a national nor a federal constitution, but a composition of both. 
Federalist Paper Number 51 was written either by James Madison or Alexander Hamilton. Um, so this one addresses the idea of checks and balances and the separation of powers for the government. As you know, the idea of checks and balances and the separation of powers are important aspects of our national government. In Federalist Paper Number 51, the author, who's most likely Madison, gets into all of the de details about the three branches of government, the legislative, judicial, and executive branches, and how they will each be self-sufficient, not having too much power, while also having some power over the others. Ultimately, Federalist Paper Number 51 is an argument about how the various powers of government should be exercised separately and distinctly in order to guard the society against the oppression of its rulers. Federalist Paper Number 58 was written by James Madison. This is the last one we're going to cover here, and this one deals with the apportionment of representatives for each state. Constitutionally, the number of senators per state is two, no matter what the population of the state is. The number of, of representatives, however, in the House was going to be determined by um, population. So at the time, 30,000 per representative. The Anti-Federalists worried that the promises that were being made by the Constitution's proponents would go unfulfilled and they did not believe that the number of representatives would actually increase over time as a result of the census, which was a topic that was discussed in Federalist Paper Number 55. So in Federalist Paper Number 58, Madison warns that if the House becomes too large, it would pose a greater threat to liberty than if it remained too small, and how fewer representatives in the House are actually more beneficial than having a big number. His reasoning was that when there are more representatives than needed, passion would rule over logic and order, and with more representatives in the House, chaos would prevail over order and unification. Madison felt that the more representatives in the House, the less information and insight each representative would be able to have. Madison also argued that if there are more representatives, they are more likely to be easily persuaded by a cunning speaker because the weak mindedness of the majority cannot withstand the shrewdness of the minority. In Federalist Paper Number 58, Madison also briefly discussed how some of the states wanted rulings to be passed on a vote of more than a majority. But he said that this method of voting is inefficient and that no laws would ever get passed. Also, it would result in a government that is more oligarchic than democratic because oligarchies follow the rule of the elite minority instead of the major majority. The founders of the United States were deeply influenced by republicanism, Locke, and the optimism of the European Enlightenment. George Washington, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson all agreed that laws, rather than men, should be the final sanction and that the government should be responsible to the government. Now I'm going to keep this information minimal and I encourage you to check out the boot camp on the Constitution because that will get in depth in what you need to understand. The Constitution defines the principal organs of the government and their jurisdictions, as well as the basic rights of citizens. It is the oldest written Constitution in use, and it has been amended 27 times. So while the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, offer specific protections of individual liberty and justice and place restrictions on the power of government, the majority of the 17 leader amendments expanded individual civil rights protections, among other things. So just as a brief summary, we have safeguards of liberty are in amendments one, two, and three. Safeguards of justice are in amendments four, five, six, seven, and eight. Unenumerated rights and reserved powers are in amendments nine and 10. I get a lot of questions about this. So just quickly, individuals have other fundamental rights in addition to those stated in the constitution. And any powers that are not listed explicitly in the constitution is left to the states or the people. Uh, governmental authority is in amendments 11, 16, 18, and 21. Safeguards of civil rights can be seen in amendments 13, 14, 15, 19, 23, 24, and 26. Government processes and procedures are in amendments 12, 17, 20, 22, 25, and 27. The Constitution consists of seven articles. For a more formal discussion about the Constitution, like I said, check out the boot camp session on the Constitution. And don't forget to download the infographic on the amendments and landmark Supreme Court cases that I'll drop in the comments below. 
They're also located in the lib guides that you can find on the Broward College Civic Literacy Resource website. I'll include the, uh, the URL for that at the end and also in the comments. So now let's turn our attention to the Bill of Rights. We discussed how the Federalists thought we didn't need a Bill of Rights because it would already be covered within the Constitution, but the Anti-Federalists believed that the inclusion of the Bill of Rights was necessary. The Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments of the US Constitution. We can see the inspiration from previous documents like the Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and the Northwest Ordinance, all in the Bill of Rights. James Madison studied the deficiencies of the Constitution, pointed out by the Anti-Federalists, and then created corrective proposals in the form of 12 Articles of Amendment. Madison wanted these incorporated into the Constitution, but of course, that did not happen, and instead, Articles 3 through 12 were ratified as additions to the Constitution and became Amendments 1 through 10 on December 15, 1791. Again, I'm keeping this information minimal because I encourage you to check out the boot camp on the Constitution, where we'll get really in depth in all, on all of these amendments and the Bill of Rights. But as a brief summary of the Bill of Rights, Amendment 1 is freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Amendment 2, right to bear arms in order to maintain a well-regulated militia. Amendment 3, no quartering of soldiers. Amendment 4, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures. Amendment five, right to due process of law, freedom from self-incrimination and double jeopardy. Amendment number six, rights of the accused persons, like the right to a speedy and public trial. Amendment seven, right of trial by jury in civil cases. Amendment eight, freedom from excessive bail, cruel and unusual punishment. Amendment 9 covers other rights of the people we just discussed, and number 10, the powers reserved for the states, which we also just discussed. The Bill of Rights offered specific protections of individual liberty and justice and placed restrictions on the power of the government. For a more formal discussion, again, check out the, uh, the Constitution Boot Camp, and don't forget to download the infographic on the amendments and landmark Supreme Court cases that are in the comments below, and then the LibGuides that you can find on the Broward College Civic Literacy Resource website. So now let's turn our attention to how the principles contained in the foundational documents contribute, contributed to the expansion of civil rights and liberties over time. We see how different groups of people like African-Americans, immigrants, Native Americans, and women, how their civil rights expanded through legislative action like the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, as well as through executive action, like Truman's desegregation of the army, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, and the rulings of the court, like in Brown versus Board of Education. The founding documents, such as the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, played a huge role in setting the precedent for the future granting of rights. We'll begin by looking at the Emancipation Proclamation. Although the Declaration of Independence stated that all men are created equal, this was not the case for much of our history. The differences between the North and the South on slavery eventually led to the Civil War, which took place from 1861 to 1865. Three years into the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which was an executive order stating that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforward shall be free. It's important to keep in mind that only slaves living in the states not under the control of the Union were free. So the slaves in Confederate states like Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, sections of Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, and sections of Virginia became free. And the Emancipation Proclamation applied to more than 3.5 million of the 4 million enslaved people in our country. I Have a Dream is a speech that was delivered on August 28, 1963, by Baptist minister and civil rights activist, Martin Luther King Jr. during the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. In the speech, King outlined the long history of racial injustice in America and encouraged his audience to hold their country accountable to its own founding promises of freedom, justice, and equality for all. He called for civil and economic rights and an end to racism and segregation in the United States. King encouraged the use of nonviolent protests. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the most iconic figures, and this was one of the most iconic speeches of the civil rights movement. He addressed 200,000 people in Washington, D.C., 
and famously shared his dream of an America where his children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. King references the Emancipation Proclamation as a great beacon light of hope for slaves who are experiencing injustice, but passionately argued that despite this hope, a lot more work was required for African Americans to be truly free in their own country. In his I Have a Dream speech, King tells his listeners that now is the time to fight for democracy and for brotherhood, and explains that the struggle is just beginning. He also tells the crowd that the fight has to be won with dignity and nonviolence, keeping the ultimate goal in mind. King urged his listeners to continue to have faith and not wallow in the valley of despair. He shared that he has a dream that the nation will rise up and become truly equal, and one day there will no longer be injustice or oppression. <clears throat> the Civil Rights Act was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson on July 2nd, 1964. The Civil Rights Act is considered a landmark civil rights and labor law in the United States and was the most sweeping civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. It outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It ended unequal application of voter registration requirements and racial segregation in schools, at the workplace, and by facilities that serve the general public. Although its 11 titles collectively address discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, and sex, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was originally created to respond to racial discrimination and segregation. You can see a breakdown of the different titles. And then what I wanted to highlight here is there's an asterisk on Title VII because perhaps one of the most well-known parts of the Civil Rights Act is Title VII, which created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or EEO EEOC to implement the law. The EEOC enforces laws that prohibit discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or age. When it comes to hiring, promoting, firing, setting wages, testing, training, apprenticeship, and all other terms and conditions of employment. Now, at first, the powers given to enforce this act were really weak, but that changed over time, and Congress has asserted its authority to legislate using different powers of the Constitution, such as its power to regulate interstate commerce, its duty to guarantee all citizens equal protection of the law through the 14th Amendment, and its duty to protect voting rights under the 15th Amendment. Right. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 is a landmark piece of federal legislation that was signed into law on August 6, 1965 by President Lyndon Johnson. African Americans were grants, guaranteed the right to vote under the 15th Amendment, but faced many obstacles to exercise this right. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 outlawed the discriminatory voting practices adopted in many Southern states after the Civil War, including literacy tests as a prerequisite to voting. It also provided for federal oversight of voter registration in areas where less than 50% of the non-white population had not registered to vote, and authorized the U.S. Attorney General to investigate the use of poll taxes in state and local elections. The 24th Amendment made poll taxes illegal in federal elections and poll taxes were banned in state elections in 1966 by the US Supreme Court case, Harper versus Virginia State Board of Elections. Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders were present at the ceremony when the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed. The Voting Rights Act had an immediate impact. By the end of 1965, a quarter of a million new Black voters had been registered, and by the end of 1966, only four out of the 13 Southern states had fewer than 50% of African Americans registered to vote. The Voting Rights Act in 1965 was readopted and strengthened in 1970, 1975, and 1982. An expansion of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Civil Rights Act in 1968 is a landmark law signed into law by United States President Lyndon Johnson. It is popularly known as the Fair Housing Act and it prohibits discrimination concerning the sale, rental, or financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, and sex. Since 1988, the act has protected people with disabilities and families with children. If you have any questions or would like some one-on-one -on -one help to pass a civic literacy competency exam, Broward College has tutors available. 
The, con the contact information is available on this slide. And finally, to get more information about where to test, who needs to test, and general information, as well as frequently asked questions about the competency exam, you can visit Broward.edu slash civic literacy. That is also where you can access the very helpful resources in the LibGuides. Thank you for watching, and be sure to check out the other boot camps, which include the Constitution, American Democracy, and Supreme Court cases. Thank you.